Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review, uh, and this is session 23. And I should, should say, because I realize I'm going to break this down into parts, this is the Sonship Review part 1. Uh, it has to do with justification, and this is session 23. Take a look with me at the PowerPoint, and let's look at the overview of what we're going to be covering in this first lesson today. We're going to look at the three-step process to handle tribulations. In the past, in your notes, I called it a four-step process. There's four things in it, but it's actually only three steps. I kept using, so anyway, if you look in your old notes and go, well, he used to say it was a four-step process. It's tribulation, patience, experience, hope. There's four things, but there's actually only three steps. So I corrected myself just so you'd know. It's not going to change up what I taught you about it. It's just when it comes to actual steps, I didn't want someone to come along and go, it says four steps, but I only see three. It's because that's really all there is. Okay. Secondly, and we're going to go through that process. Look, let me just say this. Because this is the process you're going to use for every type of tribulation from here on out. If you get this process down and you're able to use it in the context of your justification, it will be very easy to take that same process and put it into work in Romans 8 and to put it into work in Romans 13 and continue on up to the book of Ephesians. It's got, when we put on the whole armor of God, this process, it'll, it'll be in you. You'll be familiar with it, it, it and, and it'll just become second nature to you. And so it's good that we're seeing it here. Okay, number two, we're going to look at the godly thinking that we're supposed to have when tribulations occur. And then number three, we're going to look at the two-step process to counter the attacks against the gospel. Now, I know that we have said these things, but I'm saying them again today because I'm going to bring out a couple of aspects I think will make everything clear for us. Uh, and, and, then, and then I'm going to make a practical application of this. Practical. This is no longer going to be head knowledge. Back when we first went through this, I think it was my fault um, because I, uh, I, I don't think I did enough practical application. I kept waiting until we got to the education, thinking that that's when we would make an application. We're actually going to be able to do that right here. And as we go back through this in this review, and I see things I didn't recognize the first time I taught through this, I recognize all over again how important it is to be a fully educated son when you teach this. Uh, but you know what? I wasn't in Romans 13 when we went through Romans 5. And, uh, and I'm not a fully educated son now. But it's important for me to get as far <laughs> as I can get because it's beneficial for all of us. The more I know, then the more we see as we go through it. All right. Now, having said that, I want to talk about the particular tribulations that we've been talking about here. Now, I have something on the board. We are going to come back to that. But the tribulations that we are talking about here in Romans 5, in the context of our justification, those are tribulations of the gospel. And those tribulations are going to take on two forms. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to corrupt our understanding of the true gospel of Christ. That is, you are justified unto eternal life by grace through faith without works. That's it. There are corruptions of that and Satan uh, is, is promoting those corruptions of the true gospel. You know why? Because if people don't believe the right gospel, they're not going to be saved. And so obviously there are going to be corruptions. But there's going to be a second kind of attack. I thought I got rid of this marker. I kept When I was writing these up, I kept changing markers, trying to get that's much better. And the, and the second part of these attacks is to shame you into silence. 
with regard to the true gospel. To make you ashamed of that gospel. Now that's, that's called, Paul calls these the tribulations of the gospel. We are going to encounter more than one kind of tribulation in our sonship life. But this is the ones, that, this is the kind that we start out with. You'll be really glad because this is, this is a good way to get your feet wet, so to speak, and to get acclimated to dealing with tribulations. Now, I'm going to say it to you this way. Two things about this. This past Thursday, a friend of Clinton's came to my house to see me. Clinton has been a, a pretty good ambassador. He's been taking, I guess, the DVDs. Y'all watching online or you're watching some of your old DVDs? The DVDs. All right, he takes them out. And so he's got this guy. Um, the guy probably didn't stand a chance. He's only been out there a few months and, you know. So he's, he's looking at Sonship and he sees something He's very interested in, and so he has all these questions. So he called me up and he said, uh, I want to come by and ask you these questions. So Thursday he did that. And I thought he might be here today. It doesn't mean he won't ever be here if he's not here today. But he li he's lives in Sanderson, doesn't he? And so um, anyway, he came out to the house and he said, Boy, I got a whole list of questions. He pulled a little notebook out and and I said, uh, okay. And he said, man, he said, I, I just, but I just want to tell you, this sounds great. And I started to talk with him. And if he was here, I'd be saying this the exact same way that I'm saying it to you now. Because if he keeps studying, he's going to hear this tape. And I said, well, as we get started, let me ask you a question. First, what, what are you looking at? And he said, I'm on like number 23 there at the start of Romans in justification. And I thought, wow, that's really close to where we are in this review. And I said, well, okay, here's my second question. Tell me when you trusted Jesus Christ as your all-sufficient Savior. And he said, that was actually one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. I think I need to do that. He said, would that be okay? Oh, I don't know. I'm awfully busy. I don't know. Of course that'll be okay. So Thursday, um, Cody received the Lord as his, as his all-sufficient Savior and was justified into eternal life. Now, look, you know what, you can, when you run into that, you can get into this debate about with people like, well, maybe you already did this, let's go back. Look, you know what the best thing to do is? Settle that issue. If he was already justified, I don't know that he was, but if he was, it doesn't hurt him to know that he did something from an understanding. So you know what we did? We went back and we talked about what salvation was. That it is being it justified in the eyes of God by grace. God gives it as a free gift. Through faith, God gives it as a free gift to those who exercise faith in what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. And nothing gets added to that. And I explained to him very thoroughly, you know me, as a matter of fact, Ruby was telling me about our conversation with Clinton about this. And, you know, he said, I got questions. And Clinton said, well, look, you got to know that if you're going to go ask Mike questions, it's going to take a while. <laughs> because, well, and he's, but, but he wasn't just saying because I'm so verbose, although I may be, because everything is connected to something else that you have to understand. So good job, Clinton. To set the stage for all of that. So you know what? When we got through and I quizzed him, he understands that if he were to put his faith in, okay, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, but I also need to be baptized. Or I also need to join the church. Or I also need to do some good works. That you're ultimately, when you add that, you're ultimately saying what Christ did is not sufficient in and of itself. It's not enough. I've got to do something to add to that. 
And that's not saving faith. You're right back to trying to produce your own justification. Well, why I want, the reason I brought that up is because, not to just dwell on that, but I did want to talk about the fact that, you know, that work that Clinton's doing out there has not been for nothing. I mean, this, this guy is really uh, excited. But now, here's what I want to say. And I told him this. Uh, take longer. I took longer to tell him than I'm going to tell you because once I say it, you know. He is going to encounter these two tribulations of the gospel now. It is too late to unjustify him. That's the good news. There's nothing he can do to have God take away his righteousness and now impute sin back to him. That is a finished process. And that's good news. So it's permanent. But here's what Satan will do. Instead of this guy going around now and telling anybody that you are saved by grace through faith without works, he would rather corrupt this guy's understanding. And so, and, and that's what he'll do. And if, and if he's not going to corrupt the true message, then he would want to put him in a situation where he would shame him into silence. Now, I do want to say one other thing about this, and we'll talk about this in detail later on, but I, want to, I just want to bring it up now. Satan is not going to individuals in the world and whispering in their ear, or let's do it the way we would think, planting thoughts in their mind to get them to personally go attack this man or even the people sitting in this room. Here's how he has done this. Through his course of this world, he has created an atmosphere that is now full of the corruptions. And so what's happened is these corruptions have been repeated and repeated and repeated. That whole religions now have formed around them. For instance... There's a verse in Mark 16, 16 that says this, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the first half of the verse. So the church of Christ adhere to that verse and they say, you, to be saved you need to believe on Jesus and be baptized. That is a corruption of the true gospel. And if anybody is trusting in their baptism at all, then listen, their faith wasn't in what Christ did as being sufficient. That's what saving faith is. Now I know that that's sad because if that's true, and it is, then there's a whole lot of people in the church of Christ that are not going to go to heaven. And that is that is, the, is the, 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 the evil of the corruption. And they're sincere. My son-in-law, he was raised in a church of Christ home. And, and when he married my daughter and started coming to the church, and he never really went to church. You know, I mean, he's raised in that as a kid. And you know how it is when you're a teenager and, you know, you get all rebellious and you take off and do your own thing, and he just drops out on God altogether. And then when he marries my daughter, and, um, and, he, and, he, and he starts coming, and he starts hearing the truth, uh, he had to hear this from family members that, you, you know what, you, you're going to go to hell if you don't, you know, and then just attach, you know, whatever it is that's said. That's, that's, that's the price of the corruption. So I'm not saying that the devil is going to come to this man, but what I'm saying is now, there will be an effort. The, the thing is already in place. In other words, it's already a part of the culture. It's already a part of the society. It's already part of the, the religion of many people. And that now is just going to be the way that it is. By the way, it was there before he got saved too. It was which shows you how important the, the work that Clinton is doing with him. Because he hears the truth, he responds to the truth, and now what he's got to do is he's got to make sure that he doesn't get corrupted. Now we went through all that, and I think he's got his feet planted pretty firmly, 
But I said, here's the next thing, though. When you hear those corruptions, or you're in an atmosphere where someone now is making statements that are meant to shame you over the fact that you have believed the true gospel, God is now going to give you some doctrine to deal with that, to deal with both of these tribulations. So that's all that's in Romans 5, because the context is how you got saved. That's the tribulations there. But look, as we learn to put that three step, that, well, I've, I've already gone beyond that now, that three step process to handle tribulations, as we put that into motion to handle these tribulations, then the tribulations that happen in your everyday life as part of the sufferings of this present time, that's the same process you're going to use. But you're going to look at different doctrine, but it's the same process. What's the doctrine that we're going to look at in order to combat these tribulations? It's everything that we've learned up to this point in the book of Romans. He's given you the doctrine, and now he's going to tell you how to utilize that doctrine to combat those tribulations. So we're going to, and then, guess what? We're going to get into sanctification. You're going to be given more doctrine, and you're going to be taught to use the same process now to handle the tribulations of everyday life. And then you're going to be taught how to handle the tribulations of the individualized attack from the adversary because you cast off his works of darkness and you provoked him into a response. But you're going to use the same process. So this is very valuable for us to wrap our minds around. Okay, so here is that process right here, Romans 5.3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. And when he says not only so, you remember what was previous to that. He said, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. I want to be clear. When he says we glory in tribulations also, he's not saying I'm happy about encountering these tribulations of the gospel. He's not saying I'm happy that someone is corrupting the gospel or trying to shame believers into silence. He's saying, but we glory in the midst of of those tribulations, not in the tribulations themselves. In other words, our rejoicing and hope is not going to be diminished and not going to be affected by these tribulations. We're going to continue to glory in the midst of those. Everybody got that? Okay. And he says, knowing that, and that, and that, I just highlighted it here to say, because there's something you've got to know in order for that to remain true. For you to continue to rejoice for you to glory in the midst of those tribulations, then there's something you've got to know. And, that, and, so, that's all, and so now we're going to, go to look at the same verse again, highlighting the first step, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So the first thing God wants to do is change the way you think about things. You know this process. Godly thinking, godly living, Godly labor. Old hat for us now. So the first thing he wants to do now is make sure that these tribulations do not have their intended effect upon you. What now? This is what they're trying to do. But what is that supposed... What? But let's change that just for a moment. Yes, they are trying to corrupt the, the message of the, the truth. And, and yeah, they are trying to silence anybody from giving the true message. But if you have already been justified into eternal life, and you understand that it's by grace through faith without works, and you believe that, Satan wants to do something with you. He wants to make you doubt. He wants to make you second guess. Did I really have this right? Did I, am I, did I really believe the right way? And it's going to get confusing for people who don't know the doctrine. Because you know what they're going to do? They're going to hear a guy like me go, by grace through faith without works. And then they're going to hear another guy read James chapter 2 and say, you see then how Abraham was justified by works. And the, No, it's not. But see, if they don't know the doctrine, they're going to go, I, I don't know, it's so confusing. Uh, Mike's got verses and this other guy's got verses. I, it, it's all very confusing. And that's why... You have to get this doctrine down. You can't just, 
and, and, and so and the, and by the way, there's something there's something riding on this, not just your own assurance. Yeah, uh, yes, there's an impact being made in the heavenly places. Exactly right. And there's an impact being made by those that are listening to your conversation. Someone's talking to you about it, and, 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 or, or they're talking to someone about it, and, and the person goes, well, I don't know. I mean, it's all very confusing. I'm just not sure. Maybe this person hears that, and they go, well, now I'm not so sure. So you, you, we can't allow Satan's untruth to continue unimpeded. Okay, so... Here's what's going to happen. Tribulation worketh patience. And I want to talk to you about the way that that happens. And first of all, we have to remind ourselves what patience is. And here it is. Patience consists in the abstaining from all complaint or indication of what one suffers. And patience endures with an... Now, this is the part that's important for us. Patience endures with an easy mind and without the disturbance of our looks and words. So, let's suppose for a moment, let me use Crystal. Can I use you for a second? Come up to the platform. Where, where can I sit her that we can see her? Can, do, can she be seen right here, Mark? Mark? Sit right here and let's see if he can see you on the camera. Okay. You got her? Okay. Now here's Crystal. Now Crystal has been saved. And, then, and, and, she's, and she hears this doctrine. But let's suppose that someone comes along and they're going to now say something different than the true gospel. They're going to talk to her in, in, in a little different way. And so they're going to say, let me tell you something that I learned, Crystal. I learned that if you don't get baptized and join the church, that you're not really saved. If she's not sure of what she believes, what will be going on in her? What will go on in you? If you're not sure and somebody says that, I'm going to be very confused. She's going to be confused. She'll start to doubt. And if, she, and if you start doubting, if, if, if you really believe the truth, what, what will happen? What do you be thinking then? Well, if I believe the truth, then I won't be doubting. No, okay, but let's suppose that someone said something that made you doubt. I'm going to have to repeat what she says because she's not wearing the microphone and I want this to pick up. Uh, very confused, very... Will you be doubting. worried then about whether or not you were saved? Yeah, you'd be, okay, she'd be confused, she'd be, she'd be doubting, she'd be wondering if she was really saved. And if you're wondering if you're really saved, are you going to be telling anybody about how to be saved? No. No, and, and that's obvious, isn't it? Because if I'm not sure how you get saved, I'm not sure what to tell anybody about how to be saved. So, as we're looking at this, now look at that, look at that definition, that second part of patience. Patience endures with an easy mind because if you hear something that shakes your, your, your belief, do you have an easy mind about that? No. You know what you do now? You panic. Uh, well, what if they're right? And it's an easy mind without the disturbance of our looks and words. So if she heard someone corrupt the gospel and she, you know, she, she didn't, all she did is she got saved one day, but no one ever taught her the doctrine behind justification. Because that's what makes you sure. So when she got taught the doctrine, she becomes sure. But when she doesn't know the doctrine and then someone comes along with the corrupt version of the gospel, all of a sudden now, she's panicked. I, I, I'm even worried about, am I really saved? She might go home and say to her mom, look, I, how, do we, how do we know? How do we know? And, and, and then and disturbance of looks and words? See, that's not patience. But here's the other thing. Patience is not an act. The Bible is not saying, act like you're patient when you're really not. 
That doesn't do any good, does it? No. Okay, you want to go sit down for a minute and I'll bring you back up? No. You want to stay here? Well, if you're going to bring me back up, yeah. Okay, go sit down. I won't bring you back up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, she said, yeah. Here's, so here, here's the thing. He's not telling us, fake it like you're patient. And, and then you will be patient. That's not it. The way you hear this accusation against what you believed without panicking, without worrying, without, oh, what am I going to do? Without any of that, the way you endure these tribulations with patience is because you know something. That doctrine. You remember, we said this back when we did orientation, and since it's a review, I'll call it back up. You know what? It's your father's job to tell you what you need to know. It's your job to believe what he tells you. That's your job. And if you can believe what he says to you, there it is. And that's what, produ that's what enables you to go through those tribulations of the gospel without being affected by them. So that, that corruption, it doesn't make you doubt. Because you know. Because you know. Um, let me see if I can give you a, I know I know you get what I'm saying, but uh, this illustration kind of popped into my head. I can't remember who in here said it to me, though. Maybe it was Clifford. But he said someone told him that... Um, at the church here, we do not use the King James Bible. Wasn't that you that told me that? It wasn't you? That we don't use it? Yeah, that we don't. We, that we use the NIV or something like that. And they went, I can't remember who it was. I thought it was Clifford. But anyway, someone told me that. And they said, well, I can tell you, we only use the King James. And they said, no, that's, that's, that's not right. And they said, well, I go there, I would know. And the person went, no, no, that he, uses, he uses something else. Well, see, that becomes ridiculous after a while, doesn't it? Because he's chosen to believe something in the face of the facts. Uh, first of all, the stuff is online. I would dare anybody to find me using another version in all of the hundreds of lessons that are posted online. Secondly, you know, in fact, I've got a deal on our website about defending the King James. I mean, give me a break. But you know what? Someone heard something and they think, you know, that's the way that's the way that is. Well, look, if someone said that to you, would you say, if they went, oh no, that guy uses, he uses the NIV, would you panic and go, oh my goodness? You would roll your eyes and go, you have no clue. That's the response that you're supposed to have to the tribulations of the gospel. When someone comes along and says, you need to work to be saved, or you, need, you know what, you need to be a member of this church to be saved, or you need to, to perform this ceremony in order to be saved, or you're not really saved, and no matter how much they emphasize it and try to intimidate you, does it have an effect on you? If you know the doctrine does have any more of effect than someone saying, you know what, that group over there, they're slaughtering chickens in there and doing I mean, you know what? You would look at that and go, you don't know what you're talking about. Would it fry, we, yeah, well, we do eat fried chicken. Now, we do do that. But you, you, you see, what, do you understand what I'm saying? That we, can you endure that patiently? Yes. yes, you can. You can endure that patiently because you know better. And that's what's going on here. Uh, Clinton? Well, you kinda, that, one day when I was talking to Cody, was because uh, he's got a lot of friends and they use all different Bibles. And we watched that video on, you know. The King James? King James. I've been watching it three times before. <laughs> he's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> Right. It made sense to him then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it really surprised him, and then he was like, you know. 
Yeah, well, yeah, and you know what? And once you know, the attack against that doesn't phase you anymore. Yeah. All right, so here's what, now look, I need to go over because I need to get to this. Because in the second session, I, I need us to put this into use. I need you to see how to use this. So let me, let me, let me move on with this. Um, and the second part, and patience experience. And so as you, without being ruffled, as you patiently encounter these tribulations, even these, this one. See, the doctrine is supposed to produce such confidence that even when someone tries to shame you into silence, you do what Paul did in his introduction in Romans 1.16. Because in Romans 1.16, Paul says, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It, it, it kind of goads you into doing something you might not have been thinking about doing, exactly. And so, instead of being shamed into silence, it now has you declare the fact that you're not ashamed of it. And, and, and that's, look, the adversary wants one thing out of this. Your father means to produce another out of the exact same thing. Okay, now, so, and patience experience. Let me give you the experience thing. I gave you that one in white up there. I gave that to you in your notes last week, but I didn't include this second one that I have bolded in yellow here. So you know about experience, the action of putting the, uh, to the test, proof by actual trial, practical demonstration. But look at this other definition here. Knowledge resulting from what one has undergone. And if you know the doctrine and you encounter the tribulations of the gospel, and those things are not having their intended effect on you. You're not doubting. You're not cowering. Uh, you know, don't let I won't let anybody know I'm a believer. I, you know, I, you, 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 those things are not affecting you that way. Then you know what? That knowledge results from what? The more you encounter that, guess what? The more experience you're getting. The, and the more you do, th this works with anything, learning to ride a bike, operate a piece of machinery, the more you do it, the more experienced you get at it. More yeah, you're comfortable with it. It's not intimidating to you anymore. I remember when I first started witnessing to people, it was just frightening to think I was going to be talking to somebody about the gospel. But it, w once you've done it and done it and done it and done it, you know what? That, you can just do that. It's not, it's not like a big official deal anymore. But, but I want to use this word experience. It's not, on your, it's not on the PowerPoint. But I looked at this word experienced because I, because I said that. It, it, it says, you know, tribulation work with patience and patience experience. And I said, and the more you do it, the more experienced you get. And I looked up that word experienced in the Oxford English Dictionary. This was really good because here's what it said. Um, well, let me get to it because, I, again, it's not on the deal. Experience, and this is the number one definition, wise or skillful through experience. I thought, wow, that's a perfect match for sonship. Yeah, wise and skillful. I couldn't remember if there's one L or two in that. But anyway, probably one since I wrote two. Is there? Okay. Wise and skillful. And you know what? That's what the experience is doing. It's making you skillful to handle these tribulations of the gospel. And that wisdom, that comes right out of the doctrine. Okay, now I need to show you an illustration of how this gets put into work. This is important for us to look at. Uh, when the Lord Jesus started His public ministry, very soon after He started His public ministry, He went into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. I want to show you these temptations and His response each time. So here it is. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And now here comes that first temptation. 
And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now that's, that's a pretty good temptation for a guy that just fasted 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible declared he was hungry. So that temptation to command that these stones be made bread uh, is something that he could be thinking, man, you know what, I could really use some bread right now. But I want you to notice that what, what the Lord does here, in order to handle that temptation, by the way, there's more to these than just what I'm going to talk about today, but I'm not trying to divert us in a big way here. But what Jesus does is he uses Scripture he is actually going to quote something out of Deuteronomy chapter 8 when he says this. But he answered and said, it is written. So he's appealing to the scriptures. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So here we go with the second temptation. This time, Satan gets smart. You know what he thinks? I'm going to quote scripture to him. And listen to me, when you encounter a tribulation of the gospel, a lot of times someone is going to try to quote a scripture to you. Just because they do doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. The devil here is the prime example. He's going to quote from Psalm 91. Then the devil taketh him up to the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, ah, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. But Jesus, you know what he's really asking Jesus to do? All right, I carried you up here to the pinnacle of the temple. Cast yourself down. Let's just see the angels miraculously save you down. I mean, you know, that's what it's written. Let's just see that. Jesus knows that's not how God is operating. So, he, so here's what Jesus does. He, re, he replies, also with a scripture. And he says, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Just because Satan had a scripture didn't mean he used it properly. He did not. He, he was not using that for the purpose for which it was written. So when you see or you hear someone do this, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Or they say this, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? You understand that they're using a scripture that does not apply to your eternal life. So what you could say, so you could do kind of like Jesus did. And, and you could say it like this. It is also written... <laughs> For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. That's the eternal life justification. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. There's a passage that corrects that improper use of James chapter 2. There's not anything wrong with James 2. The problem is the misapplication of it. And so that corrects that. And then you could also go, just like in, uh, the, uh, we could do it in a shorter way, how about Romans 3.20? Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Once again, this is talking about a justification in the eyes of God, which is unto eternal life. Not a justification like in James, which is in the eyes of men. Because my, a lot of times when people are bringing this stuff up to you, it's, it's not that they want to know the truth or that they're really questioning about it. They just want to debate mm -hmm. because they're going to be right. True. You know, and that's, they're not even looking for a truthful answer. I want to say that because people are going to be wondering what I'm listening to here. You're saying uh, there's a lot of times when people bring those things up, they're not even looking for the truth. They're just looking for a debate. And that is true. And, and if matter of fact, you all, you all know that even though you were to give them these verses, a lot of those people, it won't make a dime's worth of difference to them. And, and, uh, but, but you're right. 
But for, but for someone who may be wondering, and someone who is listening, the fact that they heard the truth can make a real impact. There will always be people who will reject the truth, you know, at the end. All right, now let me take you back now to the third temptation. And by the way, I know what you're, th I, I, I say I know what you're thinking. I know what may be in someone's mind as they think about, well, wait a minute. How, how, what do I got to do to get myself equipped? Jesus evidently knew these scriptures. That's why I was talking about we got to know the doctrine. So if we know the doctrine, we'll be able to counter what is said. And if you say, well, yeah, but am I really going to be able to do that? You will. And let me tell you what a nice guy I am. I actually made flashcards with the objection on the front. You'll have to cut your own out. I chinsed out on that. But I, I didn't cut them for a purpose. You'll see why before we leave. But you can. Well, you can cut them out and go home. And so what I did is I gave the objection on the front. And then when you turn them around, there's two sheets here. So there's 16 different objections here. And then the answer is on the back. But you feel free to get your own. Now, if you look at that and you go like, oh, man, I don't know. Look, if someone says to me, I don't think I can do that, I'm going to ask you this. Did you learn to read? Did you learn math? Do you know how to write? Then you can do this. This is just about desire. Do you want to get equipped or do you not? And, and, and I know, you, and by the way, I was talking... I was talking to my son here, and he was saying, they're, they're, he said, <laughs> he was talking about, you know, going through the book of Romans in three Sundays and, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and he said, and you guys are going into that in such detail. Um, he said, our, and I was telling him about what we were going to be doing today in the second session. And he said, you think uh, people are going to do that? And I said, look. The people that are coming, that have been coming for years, that are involved in this, they are committed to this. Uh, if, they, if they were here for entertainment purposes, they would have been gone a long time ago. He went, yeah, that is true. That is true. And so we were kind of laughing about that. And so I don't doubt, I'm not saying what I'm saying because I doubt anyone here wants to do that. I'm just saying... This can be done. And it's like anything else. The more you do it, the easier it is to do. And this is more basic than you think it is. So, all right. So anyway, we'll do this. And I'm going to hand these out in the second session. And we'll see that. But what I need to do is I need to get back over here and look at this third uh, temptation. Again, the devil taking them up to an exceeding high mountain, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. There's the repudiation of Satan and his falsehoods. For it is written, all three times Jesus is answering out of the doctrine. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him. Behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. And so, the Lord, it, it, I, I, that's, that's the, the model of answering out of the doctrine, which means we have to be aware of it. And then we come to the third step in the process, and experience hope. And I can just give you that in a nutshell. That that hope, it means that what you believed when you believe that you were justified by grace through faith without works, you are more sure of that on the other end of this thing than you ever were before. Do you know why? Because you've seen it put to the test. You've seen it come under attack. And guess what? It works. You see it work. And that may be something that we wonder about and we think... Well, does the doctrine really work to do what it's supposed to do? It really does. And, when, and so at the end, instead of you being doubtful, at the end, you're more sure than ever because it got tested. And you saw that. And that experience produced hope. And that's that same hope that was talking about in previous hope. Rejoice in hope 
of the glory of God. You're more sure about that eternal life than, than ever before. Okay. Um, and so let me, uh, let me give you, I have to say this, and I guess then we'll come back and pick this up, but let, let, let me do this last part here. The attacks against the gospel of Christ ought to produce a certain kind of thinking in you that when they come, you should realize that these are now giving you an opportunity to do something that without those attacks, you would not be able to do. You're developing a skill that otherwise you would not be able to develop. So when these attacks come, see them for the opportunity that they are and relish them. I'm not saying... I just want to go around starting arguments about the gospel. I'm not, not that. But being prepared so that when these come, you've really got to look at... Look, have you ever seen a, a lot of kids in the neighborhood, or I grew up, there's one little boy and he was trying to learn how to ride a bike. And I, I never had training wheels on a bike. I just, you know, the first bike I had, I, Dad put me on it and um, it was crash and burn until you learn to stay up. But there was a little boy that he had training wheels, and so he could ride around forever, and then the day came when his dad took the training wheels off. And oh man, you know what he did? He cried, he yelled, he finally said, I don't want to ride a bike. I don't want to ride a bike. He didn't look forward to that process of falling over Although I'd seen him fall over. I mean, you can fall over even when the bike has training wheels on it. It's just it kind of keeps itself up under some conditions. But he, he, he didn't even want to do it. Here's what I'm saying to you. Just be prepared. As much as you go through this process, you understand you're laying foundation for a different kind of tribulation that you're going to handle again in the future. The, you're gaining valuable experience here. And this is, this is going to work for you, not just now, but also out when we're in the creature. Is Satan going to be fighting us when we're in the creature? Well, we're going to have to remove him from the creature. And we're going to have to undo some things that he has done up there. When you say remove him, he's already going to be in the world. He's already going to be cast in there. Basically, he's cast in the bottom of the pit. Well, you remember that they're in the heavenly places and there's a time when he and his angels are cast unto the earth. They're going to have to be removed from those positions. Now, I know the Bible talks about, in Revelation, it talks about Michael and his angels fought and the dragon and his angels fought. But you understand who it is that's actually going to be taking over those positions in the heavenly places. That is us. And although Revelation is not talking about the part that the body of Christ plays, I do believe that we're involved in that process. You'll have to go to Paul's epistles to look at that. Satan's supposed to be locked up for that millennium. Well, for the millennium. But remember, when you get to this last part, there, there is a place when at the, at the midpoint of the tribulation in which Satan and his angels are cast to the earth and you've got that 42 months of the last half of the tribulation They've got to be cleared out, and, uh, and, that's going to be, and that's not a thing where God is just going to go, okay, they're cast out, I did it. This is an actual, and if angels, and if you're going to judge angels, administrate over angels, you're going to be directing them in this effort. So when the tribulations are going on, we're going to be up there working? Yes, sir. At that time? Yes, sir. In the last half of the tribulation. Like No, yeah, they're up there now, principalities and powers. And so when they get cast out, we assume that, by the way, there are things happening in the last half in the Great Tribulation there where some things are coming out of the heavens as part of the judgment of things on the earth. We're going to be involved in that. When the Lord says, this is, this is you know, those great hailstones and uh, the, uh, some other issues... You know what? The, we're gonna. I, I, it depends on where you're stationed as to what's exactly going on in your particular part. 
But uh, yeah, we're go and so we're, we are going to have to confront them. And not only that, um, there will be strongholds that have been built in the heavenly places that we're going to have to tear down and establish something else in its place. So there is that issue that is going to be uh, that we're immediately going to be confronted with when it comes to that. So I'm just saying when these when these tribulations come, look at them as the best practice you can get, and so take advantage of that opportunity. I don't mean get up every day and go. I sure hope I can get in a fight with somebody over the gospel today. Although we have a few in this congregation that have that kind of characteristic. <laughs> I won't mention any names, but you know who you are. So, but what I am saying is that when that time comes, think of it, here's a chance for me to become skilled in this. Here's a chance for me. Look, if I'm trying to practice something to do it, and there's a bunch of people doing it, and I've got to wait my turn every time, you know what I'm really wanting? I'm wanting to have more turns. I want to practice more. I want to get more skilled at it. I want to know how to do this. Look, look at it that way. So let me sum it up and then we'll take our break. The tribulations of the gospel give us an opportunity to produce patient endurance. This is like the beginner phase of it, right here. If, if you know the doctrine, don't get shook up when you confront those things. You patiently endure those. Secondly, they give you the opportunity to gain experience in confronting Satan's attacks. No, this is not him personally, but it is something that is in place because of what he has done. And this is, again, the beginning phase of that. It's the opportunity to become skilled in utilizing the doctrine, to learn how this works. And if you get this down, I promise you, when you get to Romans 8, it's easier. It's easier than when we went through it the first time. In fact, when we get over there, you're going to understand some things. So look, there are some things you... I don't say it's true for every single person, but there are some things you don't quite have nailed down yet in your thinking. Because of this work, when we get over there, it's going to suddenly clear up for you. In fact, it won't surprise me for, a, a, for, a, for some of you to say... You know what, I actually wasn't even thinking about that right. But because now I see how this works, I get it. I get it. And, 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 and this is how important that will be. So you'll become skilled in utilizing the doctrine. It's an opportunity to make you more sure of your hope than ever before. It's an opportunity to expose Satan's corrupted gospel. And it's an opportunity to labor with your father. And that's what this whole thing is geared for laboring with him. Okay. I have one last thing. We'll do it after the break. I have one last thing to do when we come back to the break, and that's to talk about that two-part response to the tribulations. It's very short. And then I want to pass out these cards, and I want to show you how we're going to practically respond.